there goes the recording in progress. Okay. Um, so thanks so much to everybody who's here. I'm looking forward to the discussion. I also wanted to mention that the slides are already online. So if you want to get them, you can get them. I know that this is being recorded, but if you want to just get the slides, if you just Google my name, you come to this funny picture. And then if you go down here and you look to conference presentations and you click there, here you have this, this lecture right up here. So now I'm going to go to my slides. And I also wanted to recognize uh, Anna Andresen, who is a co-author for, for this presentation. Okay, so this is a, a big project. It's been going on for years and it's a, it's a multinational project. It's, it's primarily by the uh, Arctic University of Norway in Tromsø and the Higher School of Economics in Moscow. And we've managed to attract funding in both uh, Norway and Russia and also recently in South Korea. Um, and there's lots of people involved. I'm not going to read this off, uh, but uh, these are just the, the most important key players. Most of the, these from um, UIT and HSE, uh, Trumso and, and uh, Moscow. And there have also been lots and lots of students who have been, uh, been working on this over the years. And here's a brief overview. This uh, talk will have just three parts. Where I'm going to talk about why and how we built this thing. Um, then I'm going to go a little bit into the semantic classification, which I think is um, in terms of um, theory and concepts the, are, are probably our most important contribution to linguistics as a field. And then I'm going to give you a little live tour of the Russian Constructicon. Russian Constructicon is something that is um, it's up, it's open, you can get into it, you, you, you never need a password and everybody's welcome to, to go in there and play around. Um, and my one main point, this is something that already um, Thomas uh, alluded to, is that we took very seriously Fillmore's idea that a language is a structured inventory, that a language is a constructicon. And uh, we are attempting to model the entire Russian language then as a constructicon. So why and how? Uh, let's start out with why. Uh, we can do it both for ourselves and as linguists to give a better description of our languages and also to uh, extend and test out the construction grammar and to make it possible to uh, facilitate cross-linguistic typological comparison. And in fact, I'm hoping with this talk that we will encourage more people to work on constructicons uh, and, and because this is, uh, this we've actually, a lot of the design we've thought about what would be um, what would be a good basis for further typological extension portability to other languages. And we also want to do it for our learners. I mean, a lot of us, myself included, our bread and butter is teaching language. Um, and we want to help our, our um, students to achieve greater language proficiency. Um, the, the constructions also are important for motivating use of specific word forms, which is really important in a language like Russian that has a lot of word forms, um, because those word forms typically are motivated by specific constructions, and also to fill in the gaps in current language resources and pedagogy. I'm going to go back to both of these two points in a little bit more detail. So for, <clears throat> for linguistics, we've seen in um, the uh, cognitive uh, grammar and cognitive linguistics um, uh, 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 literature, there have been some really excellent thorough studies of individual constructions and even of groups of constructions found in various languages, but we haven't as yet had um, a really comprehensive view of an entire language in term of it, terms of its constructions. And in order to achieve that, you need a pretty large inventory of constructions. And um, when you get to that point, then certain you, you, can, you can begin to answer or at least imagine answering various questions like what are the major types of meanings that multi-word grammatical constructions can encode? What meanings are more tested than others? And most important, does it form a coherent system? 
And we think indeed we have found this, and this is what I want, this is the most important thing I want to share with you today. For the learners, um, learners, of course, have access to lots of different resources like textbooks and grammars and uh, dictionaries and such. But um, there's certain kinds of constructions that are less reliably represented in these standard resources. And that's in particular, these multi-word expressions that have open slots. And this is where we have kind of, what we have targeted primarily, although not really exclusively, but primarily in our Russian Constructicon. Um, so we can think of, um, you know, it being constructions all the way up or all the way down, either way you, you, wanna, you wanna take it. But somewhere in, somewhere in between are these multi-word expressions that have open slots. Uh, and that's where our project is mainly focusing uh, focusing here. So I mean, this, this one le means literally, this is a verb phrase under uh, something accusative. And that's how you say she danced to the music or she did a lot of things following something else. Um, but we use under in, in Russian. So this is a non-transparent lease for learners. Okay, so how we built our Constructicon, when we look back on it now, we see that it took place in, in three phases approximately. I mean, at first we were just sort of like grabbing constructions from places where they were easy to harvest, like from textbooks and uh, scholarly literature. We did a certain amount of crowdsourcing, we got up to 660 there. And then after that, we went to corpus-based expansion, where we looked at um, what sorts of multi-word expressions are recognized as such in the Russian national corpus. And also we used some other corpus, uh, corpus materials. And then, you know, in the course of two or three years, we got up to a little over a thousand constructions. And once we reached that, that number, then things began to gel and we began to see that, you know, that there were little knots of constructions, little groups, little meanings. And we moved into a phase that we call system-based expansion, where we looked at uh, certain both structures and meanings of small groups of construction and said, okay, can we find more constructions that are similar to these? And this kind of turbocharged the, um, the process, because you see here that in under a year, we more than doubled the size of the Constructicon. Um, and got up to the, you know, the number that we have now, which is over 2,200. Um, one thing that we were really concerned about, though, is that we didn't want it just to be a list or just to, like a dictionary of constructions. We wanted to capture the real complexity of this and the uh, way in which the constructions are, in, are connected to each other. Um, and uh, and this is a practical construction, a practical uh, challenge for everyone. Um, and as Thomas uh, alluded to, also in the introduction, um, that uh, FrameNet has uh, been um, ha has has often been tapped as like a major resource for this. And we did we did use FrameNet, and we did start from that extent, but we didn't impose it as an assumption. So in other words, we didn't make an assumption that we would be looking only at um, constructions that involve verbs. And when we went back and then looked at what, uh, what of the constructions would be amenable to a frame that um, uh, type of analysis, we found that it was really only 8% of them that there was, there's just so many other types that, uh, that were here that we really needed to look beyond frame net. So obviously frame net is an important uh, part here. But then we needed to make sense of all of these other types of constructions. And um, this classification, rather than being, it's not, it's not top down, so we're not imposing models, but we're sort of trying laterally to inform our, inform our uh, classification based on um, various kinds of typological studies and uh, universal grammatical inventories. And I'll show you a little bit more of this in detail a little bit later on here. So like I said, this is a bottom-up approach. Um, our idea was also to you know, take this Langacarian um, uh, uh, model into, 
it, 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 to, to realize that in the sense that we weren't going to, we were going to analyze the language in its own terms and allow the patterns to emerge from the data rather than making uh, a priori assumptions. Um, and we uh, we annotated, we actually annotated and re-annotated and re-re-annotated. I mean, uh, when you start working on something like this, you say, oh, I think I know how it works. And you, then you start working out a, um, uh, out a typology and oh, well, then you find that it doesn't work because we have these other new examples. And this had, this had to be uh, redone in several iterations. Um, and fortunately we had uh, a very good group of people uh, working with us. Um, and we had both native and, no, and non-native speakers, which actually turned out to be a big advantage as well. And they, we worked together as a team over a long period of time and we worked towards consensus on the annotations of all of the constructions. Now what I want to do is I want to show you the semantic classification. So here's where it gets kind of into the nitty gritty. Um, uh, this is the bird's eye view. So from the most macro perspective, uh, we see uh, five cl general classes and then there are subclasses. So the five classes are this one, two, three, four, five here. And the subclasses are the ones that, uh, that, are, that, that are underneath each of those classes. And then we have um, uh, semantic types uh, within these. So there's 55 semantic types somewhere in you know, various places in this table. And everywhere you see a plus sign, that means, each, that, means that these can then be expanded into subtypes. And then you wind up with 182 semantic subtypes of constructions. Uh, it's really important for me to mention here uh, that um, these, uh, these classes and in all of the classification I'm going to show you, uh, it was never the case where we tried to take a given construction and shove it into just one box and leave it there. Um, instead, we uh, instead we work to recognize the relationships among them. So there are many instances where uh, we have uh, types that are related to each other and also constructions and even whole groups of constructions, families, et cetera, that, are, um, that belong to multiple types and multiple classes. So there's a lot of uh, multiple tagging going on here. So I'm gonna go through these five types one at a time, and then we're going to drill down into one of them in a little more detail. So we're gonna start out with qualia. Uh, qualia is uh, the class of constructions that describe the properties of the given objective physical world, things external to the speaker. The next group we call modality in its neighborhood, and I'm not going to attempt to explain it right now because this is the one that we're going to look at in more detail in a couple of minutes. Then we have a subjectivity. These are constructions that encode the subjective evaluation of a situation, its elements or participants by the speaker. Uh, discourse are constructions that um, structure and organize communication, often referring to a broader context than a single sentence. Often these are responses, for example. And then we have parameters which um, judge things in terms of various scales. And uh, parameters are something that can uh, be layered over all of the other types of meanings. So in a sense, parameters is, um, is something that you can add on to the, uh, each of these other four, four types. And they can, uh, so you can have kind of like this build, building on of parameters onto all of the other types. And all of the other types are also related to each other in various ways. Um, now, uh, hierarchically, we see that there are, um, various sizes of groupings, if you will, of constructions. So there are families, and that's the smallest grouping of constructions. And these are um, uh, constructions that are like near synonyms in, in a way. They share some semantic, syntactic, and or structural properties. And this is usually some sort of handful of, uh, of constructions. Um, families then group into clusters. Um, and then these will show often a, 
a radial category uh, uh, structure. So we have prototypical and peripheral distributions. And then the clusters will also form into networks and networks share a general semantic tag. And as promised, I'm going to now go into uh, modality and its neighborhood. And I'm gonna zoom in, uh, in even further within modality and its neighborhood on two clusters of prohibitive constructions. So here is a visualization of uh, this class of constructions, the modality and its neighborhood. And this class comprises 301 constructions. And we adopt the traditional understanding of modality that refers to root and epistemic modality. And these semantic types form the core center of modality as we have uh, we've enclosed in this little border here. We also consider categories that are uh, closely related uh, to this. Um, so, so these are what we consider to be the neighborhood of the of of um, of modalities. So we have volition, causation, prohibition, threat, request, apprehension, and curse. Um, and thus, we model this class as a radial category centered around the core root and epistemic modal meanings, and also including several peripheral categories. In the diagram, we have general semantic types of constructions that are visualized as boxes. And then you have these, these arrows. Um, and uh, these, uh, these uh, point to the subtypes. So for example, if we take here root modality, it has four subtypes. You see those arrows going off from it. And these correspond to dynamic and deontic possibility and necessity. You see a lot of numbers in um, in parentheses, and these are the type frequencies of each semantic type and subtype. So in other words, these are how many constructions there are in each of these little groups, at least at this point. And that's so, um, and then we have also these solid lines. They indicate the relationships of the semantic categories within the class. And then we have a couple of dashed lines you see at the edges here. Um, and the dashed lines show relationships across classes. Other classes are um, indicated with dotted blue lines here. So for example, we have volition and volition has a connection, has a connection with most of the general types within the class. So those are the solid lines. And, um, but if then if we go down towards the bottom here, you see possibility um, and it's actually related to actuality. And actuality simultaneously belongs to another large class, which is qualia. So, and here I'm gonna now give you a couple of actual examples of constructions that refer to the core and neighboring categories. So let's take a closer look at root modality, volition, and apprehension. The domain of possibility is, um, is represented by constructions that denote dynamic possibility determined by the absence of obstacles for a situation. So we would say So one can fly from London, from Moscow to London in four hours, I'm sorry, to Moscow from London in four hours, sorry about that. Um, and uh, here, it, but it's literally, it is it, it possible to fly, yeah? Uh, from from uh, from uh, to Moscow from London, um, and uh, and so and um, and then we also have deontic possibility, um, for which we use the tag permission here, and here we have an example: um, the nistrashno or nichivo yesli clause uh, construction, like nistrashno yesli azakuryu. So would you mind if I spoke, smoke? Literally, not terrible if I, do, if I will smoke. Um, and then if we go to volition, here's an example of volition, uh, which is closely related to the core central modal meanings. Um, a typical member of this category is an optative construction, like uh, which is, would it not be great if one never had to work or sort of like, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be wonderful if, um, and the semantic component of volition is also present in other categories. So for example, in apprehension, 
This is related to an undesirable situation that the speaker wants to avoid. We have So it's kind of like, oh, um, I, if, I'm afraid that Misha could be late or wouldn't it be terrible if Misha, Misha gets to be late? So we're talking about a set of affairs in which Misha is late and that's undesirable for the speaker. So now you can see how the core and neighboring categories are interrelated. Um, and moreover, the radial category structure can be used to model a network of constructions that belong to a single semantic type. Now we're going to do that. We're going to we're going to zoom in on just this one little box with prohibition with these 55 constructions. And we'll see that, so this, this is that little box, right? So if we take just this one little box and we zoom in, we have all, all of these constructions here. Those are those 55 constructions. Um, and we have the, um, this is a, an, an entire network of prohibitive constructions. And so in here, we have like two clusters. So we have a cluster on the top and a cluster on the bottom. And then we have all of these relationships between those two clusters. You see that they're rather tightly knitted with each other. Um, together, they form the network of prohibitive constructions, but they also have overlap to various other things. There's overlap to intensity with parameters, overlap with warning, overlap with threat, and overlap with request. So we have a lot of things going on there. Okay, so, um, uh, our, uh, this, this, uh, oh yeah, I'm sorry, just a second. <laughs> okay, so the class of modality is connected to other classes. Uh, for instance, modality overlaps with qualia in the semantic type of actuality, which is represented by constructions like Misha, Misha ad udalos pakuritz, Misha managed to, to take a smoke. Uh, actuality here refers to a successful realization of an action. So overall, we could say that our um, representation of the modality class as a radial category complements the typologically accepted view of core modal meanings by adding relevant adjacent categories that are closely related to the modal domain and tend to be frequently expressed by means of constructions. So that was the semantic part. And now I'm gonna take you on a tour. Um, so this is a tour of the Russian Constructicon you should be able to find it just by Googling Russian Constructicon, but here is the, here is the um, URL for it. Uh, notice that this is on GitHub, and that's, with the, that's for a reason. Uh, we have created this with o, entirely with open source um, uh, programming, and it's actually designed not to be Russian specific. It's designed with an architecture that should be portable to other languages. So if you want to make a Constructicon for another language uh, using, uh, using this, this should be fairly straightforward to do. Um, we've specifically set it up uh, with that purpose. Per today, this Constructicon contains over 2,200 constructions. Uh, so this is arguably the largest openly available Constructicon resource for any language. Um, our idea was to make this not just for ourselves, but also for teachers and learners of, of the language. It's searchable in lots of ways I'm going to show you. According to semantics and uh, anchor words, those are the, like the permanent parts of constructions and also syntax and many other things as well. Um, and as I told you, it's open source. All of the data is publicly archived and it's, and it's designed to be portable to other languages and therefore reproducible. I have like this canned thing that I've made, but I think it's more fun if I do, if I, it, so the canned thing is there, you can go and get it off the website, but I think it's more fun if I just go to this website and show it to you live. So I'm gonna do that now. So, two, two, two. so if I go to the Constructicon, sorry, here's the front page of the Constructicon. This is something you guys don't see, there we go. Um, so here's the front page of the Constructicon, and uh, and here I'm in. I'm actually in the browse. That's the default place that you come into this at. And here you see you could actually just browse the you know 2000x uh, constructions that way. You could uh, click on any one of them if you wanted to, and um, 
for example, and you come up with a construction. Uh, so here, this and every construction has a, an ID number. Uh, it also has a name, which it, it has um, a, like a, a brief explanation of what it what what it is, and then it also has like um, a uh, like a um, like a, a dependency. Well, no, it's not. I'm sorry. It has like a a grammatical um, parse of it, and then there's also a really short example. Then we have the definitions in three languages of what the construction does. So this is a construction that says that somebody looks a lot like somebody else. It literally means that he went completely into his father. So in other words, he looks like his father. Um, then we have uh, five uh, corpus it, or, or corpus inspired, but corpus examples. After that, we also have a CEFR level. So this is the Common European Framework um, of reference. So these are the standard levels for learners of a language, and these go all the way from A1 through uh, C2, so all of the possible levels. Um, and then you can click to see additional information. So for example, here I can get common fillers. So one tends to look like one's mother or one's father, for example, semantic type, syntactic type of the construct construction itself. Syntactic function of the anchor, um, the syntactic structure of the anchor, uh, the part of speech, and then we have universal dependency grammar uh, for the um, the uh, name of the construction and also for the illustration. Um, and then we have a usage label. We don't have any references in this one, but you can also um, search for constructions. So I'm going to search for a construction with this word harwush, and then I get constructions that have this uh, have this word. Uh, so here's a here's a, one of the prohibitive constructions. This means literally, hey, you up there, that's enough jumping. So it's a way to ask somebody to stop doing something. Um, and here with the, uh, I have more more fillers, fillers here and he, here you see also we have uh, various comments and even re uh, references if somebody has done some previous work on this construction. So that's the that's the browse button. Um, then we also have something called daily dose, which we think is a lot of fun. This is especially for learners. So here, uh, if you're, if if I'm learning Russian, let's say I'm a rank beginner and I'm I, I'm at A1 level, I want to get five constructions that I can learn now that will help me to learn Russian, and um, and I can say you know like I can take this one for example and get uh, get information about this construction, what it, what it means. Um, and this goes all the way up through, you know, through the C2 level, for example, so I can get, you know, all the way up to the, you know, the, the most uh, difficult, uh, difficult levels. Um, okay, and but then for us linguists, I think the most exciting thing is, is advanced search. And here, all of these are filters that you can combine in as many ways as you want to. So um, you can and you can um, click on as many different things as you want to have for this. So, for example, um, we were talking about semantic types here, um, and we looked at the prohibition. So let me see if I can find prohibition. And I want to do prohibition, and I want to have I want to learn about uh, how to tell somebody not to do something, and I'm at the B1 level. So here I get a bunch of examples of uh, of how I should <laughs> prohibit uh, of prohibition at the B1 level, um, including that one that we saw a little bit earlier. Uh, where is it? There it is. This you know, hey you up there, stop jumping. Um, so, uh, and, and you can even combine, um, if I do this, you can even combine um, a multiple semantic types. And um, for example, we could take a mirative and then we could take, um, let me take something, uh, something else with, um, uh, with a degree of intensity. So, um, oh, I didn't want absence. But degree of intensity, and I can get, you know, I can get something that's both mirative and degree of intensity. 
and I can bring up an, uh, such an example, or even this one. Some of, the, some of these have more material in them than others, as you see. So, um, and this could be also useful for uh, teachers. I mean, if you're teaching Russian and you want to, you want to choose, sorry, you want to choose, you want to choose a, 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 um, a constructions at a very, at, at a given level, you can also bring up all the constructions that are at a given level. Um, we also have instructions. Um, so this explains how to do the advanced search, particularly, but all of the, all of these tabs. Um, most, most interesting for us was that we were talking about the semantic types. Um, and if you go to semantic types, so, so literally every, every um, word or abbreviation that's anywhere on this site is explained here with examples. But if we go back down to those semantic types, we have all of the individual semantic tags are also, um, they're also explained here and every single one with, a, with, with an actual example. So this is pretty, <laughs> this is pretty thorough, I think. Um, and these two pages with the, are available in both English and in Russian. So we have all of this in English and in Russian. And then you might have noticed that there was a YouTube showing up here. We have our own YouTube channel with instructional videos for how to, um, how to use the Constructicon. And also, um, you know, here's the, here's the whole uh, YouTube channel. So uh, this basically takes you through the entire, um, uh, the entire website and how it can how it can be used and searched and all of it all of its possible functions. So there's that, and I think then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to I'm just going to um, close this out uh, with offering uh, some um, conclusions. So uh, what we're doing is we're proposing a system of semantic tags that subdivides our items into meaningful classes and smaller groups, and also facilitates the identification of constructional families. And this system of tags helps to turn the initial list of constructions into a structured network. And although our methodology and findings are of course based on a single language, they can serve as a basis for cross-linguistic comparison and as a starting point for building Constructicon resources for other languages. And that's basically what I wanted to say today. So I'm gonna stop sharing here and turn this over to anybody who wants to ask some questions. Thank you very much. Well, Laura, thank you very much for a wonderful talk and, and really ideal start to this series.